Okay, let's build a little circuit here to explore the operation of a 74HC74. It's a dual D-type flip-flop with set and reset inputs here. Um, so this is a, a fairly common um, logic device that's used is if you're building a, a, a circuit with some discrete logic, uh, not too common anymore uh, because of FPGAs and, uh, and other programmable logic. Uh, but back in the day, um, awful lot of flip-flops were sprinkled around circuits for various purposes. And we'll get into that a little bit later, but let's, uh, let's build a circuit to really dig in and, um, and explore the fundamental operation of this thing. Okay, so this is uh, an old data sheet, uh, the Motorola high-speed CMOS data, data sheet here. Lots of different chips in it, uh, but this is the one we're looking at. Okay, so the device itself is um, this little guy here. So it's a 14-pin integrated circuit, and I've got the I've got a um, the logical diagram uh, printed out from the data sheet here. So we're going to keep this handy uh, as we build the circuit so that we can keep track of what pins around the periphery of the device correspond to which function here. Um, so it's oftentimes um, a, a lot more convenient to draw a schematic out uh, logically rather than in terms of the physical layout of the chip. So let's do that. So I'm going to draw a single flip-flop here first. And um, the way, what the pins do is I've got a data, I've got a data input, and I've got a Q output, and I've got a clock input. And so what this device does is for some time period, I've got uh, my data input, let's draw data and clock. My data is, you know, some value at some point in time. And let's say that it can be either a zero or a one. It actually doesn't matter if my clock is low, um, but then at some point my data settles out. Let's say that it settles out to a zero and my clock edge comes in. Then what will happen is on the Q output, whatever my Q output is, let's say that it's high. The clock edge comes in and then sometime later, my Q output is going to drive low. Okay, and then again, only sensitive to the rising edge. So now my data can do whatever it wants for a little while. And then let's say that at some point it settles out high. And uh, another clock edge comes in. My Q output at this clock edge here, and we can actually draw the little causality here. So this clock edge causes this transition from high to low. And then this clock edge is going to cause a transition from low to high, like this. Okay, and then after that rising clock edge, after everything is settled out, we don't care what the data does. Okay, and then so the way we're going to, um, the way we're gonna show that is, again, we're gonna build a little circuit here. And um, this is a fundamental, this is the simplest D-type flip-flop. Um, so, you know, again, data input, Q output, and a clock. Um, the 74HC74 also has a complementary output, so that's Q bar. And then it also has a set and a reset or clear. And these are inverted logic. So you'll notice on the diagrams here, there's a little bubble uh, that inverts the logic. And then, so what I'm going to do is I'm gonna tie this one to VCC. So I'm going to disable the set, but I'm gonna do it through a 10K resistor. That way I can short the pin momentarily to ground in order to set it. And then same thing on clear. And it's getting a little crowded here, but we're going to draw our 10K resistor up to VCC. And then so we can see what's happening on the output, we're going to put a LED, a light emitting diode. And I've got one here. Um, this is actually a special LED that has uh, both green and red, and uh, they are anti-parallel. So let's draw that in here. I've got one LED and I need a resistor. And then I've got a the other LED in the same box again, or in the same package. Okay, so this is our little dual LED here. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the data out of one of the flip-flops in, sorry, yeah, the Q output of one of the flip-flops, and I'm gonna send it into the data input of the next flip-flop. So here's Q and here's the clock. And I'm gonna tie these clock signals to a common, 
going to short these together. So even though I haven't drawn them shorted together, I'm going to label them the same thing. So I'm going to short them together in the circuit itself. Um, and then let's see, so our clock out, our Q output here and our Q bar, let's draw that LED again, like this. And then we've got another one going like this. And then we've got our resistor. Oh, we're going to use a 470 ohm resistor. 470. And then uh, again, this output, we're, we are just driving the LED. And then we've got our set and clear as well. And same thing. Okay, great. So here's our circuit, and then we're going to drive it. We're going to drive our circuit with an AD ALM2000 that has uh, 16 digital outputs. We're going to take two of those outputs. We're going to take D0, oops, that's a zero, and uh, put it into the data input. And D1, we're going to send into the clock input. Okay, so here's our circuit. We've got it all mapped out, and uh, let's take our little... Uh, let's take our little logical diagram here and build it up. Okay, so uh, first thing that it's uh, a good idea to do with a with a breadboard is um, lay out the power and the bypassing uh, bypass capacitors here. So even though this circuit is is fairly slow, we're not we don't have a high frequency on the clock. Um, the edge rates are quite high, and when a flip flop transitions from high to low or low to high, it pulls a little slug of current uh, from the power supply. So we're going to want to bypass the supply with some capacitors here. And let's actually measure that as we're putting the bypass capacitors in. So I'm going to turn on my capacitor meter here. And I'm going to measure the rails. So let's set up our rails. There's positive, and here's negative. Let's do a couple of things here. Um, we're going to, we, we've got two buses. We've got buses on the top and the bottom of the board here. So let's make that a single common bus. Okay, so I've tied ground together and let's tie ground together on the other side of the board as well. Okay, and then notice I've got very little capacitance here, 0.35 nanofarads here. So that's just stray capacitance. Um, and then we also need to tie the power rails together. So we'll do that over on this side of the board. Okay, so I've got power and ground on both sides of the board. I've got two ground wires. I've got a single power wire connecting top and bottom. So now let's watch our meter as I install these bypass capacitors. Okay, so now I'm up to 0.1 microfarads, and then I'm going to add another down here, 0.2 microfarads, and then let's add another 0.3 microfarads, and then finally 0.4 microfarads. And this is fairly, you'll see this um, arrangements like this on actual circuit boards. You'll see logic spread across the board, and then you'll see capacitors, these little bypass capacitors sprinkled around the board here. Again, that's to provide a very stiff, low inductance um, path, uh, AC decoupling path um, all around the circuit here. And then let's install the star of the show, our little device here, and there's a notch that indicates pin one. Okay, so we'll put this in here. And then, oh, um, while we've got our capacitor meter on here, another common practice is you'll see um, low value capacitors sprinkled around the board, but somewhere on the board, you'll see a larger capacitor, um, sometimes referred to as the bulk bypass. And this is an electrolytic capacitor that's polarized. So it's uh, the negative side of the capacitor is marked with a minus. Um, you'll also see that the leads are often, uh, the positive lead is often longer than the negative lead. And I've trimmed them both to the same length so I can insert it into my breadboard and it won't be tilted. Okay, here's that. And then notice that I'm now up to 1.44 microfarads of total capacitance. Okay, let's take our meter off and turn that off. Okay, so um, on the chip itself, let's go ahead and connect power and ground. So the ground pin is pin seven. Okay, so again, looking at the um, looking at our little map here, we've got ground is pin seven and VCC is pin fourteen. Okay, so let's go and connect pin fourteen. 
to our positive supply rail. Okay, there's that. And then we can just sort of start sprinkling our various components around the board um, per our schematic here. So remember, we want the clear, the preset, the clear, and the preset to all be pulled high. So I'm going to take 10K resistors, and let's see our clear. We've got the second pin, so we're going to skip one and connect this guy high. And then we're going to skip two more pins, data and clock, and connect this guy high. Okay, and then on the bottom of the board, remember this is the ground rail and I have to skip over the ground rail to hit the positive supply. Okay, so clear is pin one. And we're going to skip two pins and looks like pin four is preset. Okay, wonderful. Um, next, let's put in our, let's uh, add our LEDs. Okay, so again, this LED you know, is fairly common. One lead will be longer than the other to indicate polarity. Um, I have trimmed those down. And I forget which way is which on these guys. Um, and I've, I've uh, you know, if you look in here, it's a little bit asymmetrical. So I'm just gonna put it, put the LED in somewhat arbitrarily. Um, and then if it's the wrong color, we'll, uh, we'll flip it around after the circuit's powered up. Okay, so the way I'm going to hook up the LED is I'm gonna hook the Q bar output to the LED and I'm gonna jump back to Q1 with a resistor. Okay, so we're gonna pop this little guy in here and we're gonna do the same thing on the top of the board. We're gonna connect one side of the LED to Q bar and then we'll jump back over with the resistor. Okay, noting that I have to straddle the ground pin with this LED here. Okay, and here's our 470 ohm resistors, and we will pop this little guy in here. And here's our other 470 ohm. We will pop this guy in here. Okay, and that should be, that should be pretty all set. Okay, um, and then the other, remember the other thing we want to do is connect the Q output of one to the data of the other flip-flop, and we want a common clock signal. Okay, so for the clock signal, we'll use this uh, white jumper wire here, and the two clocks are pin three and pin 11. So I'm gonna connect pin one, two, three, and then let's see, so it's uh, one, one, two, three, fourth pin in. So right dead center is our clock. Okay, and then data, I'll use this, uh, I'll use an orange wire here. And the two, let's see, so the, I want the Q output. Yeah, so I want pin five to go to the data input, pin five to pin 12. So there's pin five. And one thing to notice here is this is not a terribly complicated circuit, but you notice that it's already getting a little bit, a little bit tangled. Okay, so there's five, six, seven, and then the data is on the other side of my clock wire here. Okay, great. So we've got our clock side together. We've got our data where we want it. And let's spread our resistors out a little bit so nothing shorts together. And there it is. So the last step is we need to connect up our AD ALM 2000. So this guy here. Um, it is very difficult to have too many ground connections. So what I've done here, there's a number of ways to connect. The, the, M2, the AD ALM 2000 has uh, sockets on the end of these wires here. So I've taken another jumper wire and I'm gonna, going to extend those a little bit. So somewhat arbitrarily, I'm just going to connect two ground pins to the top of the board. Uh, and then I'm realizing that I have this capacitor in backwards. Okay, and then two more ground connections at the bottom of the board. Okay, and then the power supply is the red wire here. So I'm gonna power the board. At the top. 
Okay, and then last but not least, what did we say? We're going to have D0 going into the, the first D input. So the first D input is pin 2. Okay, and so that is this. It's pink and green. Okay, so I've got the pink wire is going to go to data, which is pin 2. Okay, and then pin 3 is the clock, which I'm going to put D1. Uh, let's see, the clock is pin 1, 2, 3. Okay, there it is. Okay, so let's make sure that we can see the two LEDs in the... Um, in the field of the camera here. We've got our ADALM2000 over here and we are just about ready to throw the power switch. Okay, so let's throw the power switch. So um, in order to control the ADALM2000, we're going to use Scopey, which is the, uh, the GUI that goes along with that little blue box there. And I wanna show you right from the start. So I'm just plugging in the M2K right now. So I just, um, I just connected the USB cable to my computer here. And if we give this a little minute, we should see the M2K show up in our screen here. Okay, there it is. So I'm going to click it to uh, select the device. And if I had more than one device on here, more than one M2K, I would actually see it. Um, and then at some point, you'll see some information about the device, uh, what its firmware version is, uh, some information about the software. And uh, what I want to do is connect to the device. Okay, so we'll connect. And then once Scopey has established a connection, a little software delay here. It should begin. Okay, so it'll begin, so it's connecting, and then it will go through a calibration routine, and yeah, so it's all all set and ready to go. Um, so the first thing we need to do is throw the power switch. So I'm gonna come over here into the power supply, the power supply instrument here, and I've set the voltage to three 3.3 volts, and I can set it to 4.3 or you know 2.3. 3.3. Um, the reason I'm setting it to 3.3 is that is the logic level of the uh, of the M2K's digital I/O. Um, so it's a, it, it's a perfect match. Um, it'll actually work with five volts uh, most of the time, uh, but I, I, I want. I want my supply voltage to be the same as a digital high on my peripheral here. And if all goes well, I should be able to click enable and see some action on the lights over there. And there it is. And um, what you'll notice is that one light is green and the other light is one LED is red and the other LED is green. Um, so I kind of did that on purpose. I put the LEDs in uh, backwards. I put one of them, or not, not necessarily backwards, I put them in opposite directions here. And um, I noticed something when I was um, rehearsing for this thing. So let me disable this and then come back up again. So you see that? So if I turn the power supply off and on again, now they come up both green. So let's leave it off for a couple of seconds here. See if we can get it to go one more time. Oh, still green. Okay, but you did notice that it came up in um, in opposite states here. So um, there is no guarantee when you throw the power switch on this particular flip-flop that they'll come up in any given state. Um, there is no internal power on reset circuit. So um, if you're building a circuit board and that's important, then you need to go in and explicitly clear all of your logic um, to a known state. So let's go ahead and do that. And remember, we want these LEDs to be red for a zero and green for a one. So I'm gonna go and clear, I'm going to assert the clear pins on both of these devices. And I do that by momentarily shorting the clear inputs to ground. So let's clear this guy. And so this is, this is, this is the LED that is correct. Okay, so if I set it, if I clear, the LED, it goes to ground, and if I hit the preset or the set pin, then I then it turns green. So this is in the correct polarity. So set, reset, set, reset. Now on the other side, I'm going to reset this guy, and it's 
green, which is not what I want. Um, and then just to convince ourselves, so if I if I hit the set, then it turns red. Reset, it turns green. So I'm going to go and turn this LED on. I'm going to turn this guy around, and now it is red. Okay, so operation of set and reset. So I'm going to clear. I can set, and I can set over here, and I can reset. Clear to zero, clear to zero. Okay, so if I'm building a circuit, and these are this is controlling a, a motor or a heater or something like that, and I want the heater or the motor to be off when my circuit uh, first comes up, then I the first thing I want to do is I want to assert to the clear pins on this flip-flop. Okay, so now we are in a known state, and we've demonstrated the operation of the um, of those pins. Uh, the other thing to notice is, or the other thing to note is that I wasn't giving any clock pulses to this thing. And um, the clear and the preset are what are called asynchronous inputs. So they don't depend on the clock. They're not synchronized by the clock. Okay, so let's go over here and move over to the next instrument on Scopey. So what I want to do is go to my digital IO. And if I go to my digital IO and enable the device, um, remember what we said is that the data is D0. So this is my data input over here. And my clock is this guy here. And so right now I have a zero on my data and let's bang the clock up and down. So these are both set to outputs and I'm setting my clock high and low, high and low and nothing's happening. That's because the flip-flop is already a zero and I'm clocking zeros into it. Okay, so let's go and set the data to a one and then I'm going to issue a clock pulse. So the clock went high and the first LED turned green. And if I set the clock low again, back to zero, nothing happens because the flip-flop is only sensitive to rising edges. So if I give another clock pulse, then the second LED turns green. So I've clocked a, I've clocked a one into the first flip-flop and then into the second flip-flop. And then again, I can go clock up and down, clock up and down. Nothing else happens because I'm continuing to clock ones into the string. Now let's go the other way again. I'm going to set my data to zero and I'm going to clock in that first zero and then let's clock in the second zero and both LEDs turn red. So there it is. There's every single feature of the flip-flop is now exercised. Okay, so that was a fun little introduction to the operation of a flip-flop. Um, you might have noticed that we're, we're clocking things pretty slow, like human finger press or, or clicking of a button in a piece of software there. So these flip-flops are designed uh, to run much, much, much faster. And um, in our next video, we'll dig into uh, some of the timing characteristics of this thing, which um, brings up some interesting points here. Uh, the faster you go, the less appropriate a solderless breadboard is like this. So what we're going to do is we're going to rebuild the circuit onto a uh, in, onto a permaproto board. So it's the same sort of layout as um, as a solderless breadboard here, but we can do a much better job of bussing things together using very short wires, a better job of bypassing, uh, and we'll we'll put the flip-flop in a little socket like this. And then the other thing we'll want to do is hook up our high-speed oscilloscope probes. And so there's some interesting techniques we can do uh, to get the tip of the probe very close to the signal that we're measuring uh, with a solid ground connection. So as a little teaser, um, let's uh, build up that circuit now.